to you all. Uh, we're, we're, we're waiting a little bit for Mr. Aftar, who's on his way, but uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll start it out and uh, he'll join us um, uh, in, a sh in a short while. Um, so thank you very much uh, for being here nice and early, and uh, thank you to our chief guest uh, for the day and our keynote speaker, uh, Justice Chandrachud. Um, we're very thrilled to have him finally for an idea event. We've been uh, planning on doing this for a while. Uh, and um, for those of you who um, have seen a, a, a video uh, that went viral uh, on the internet, uh, a, a terrific speech that uh, Justice uh, Chandrachud had made uh, some months back, you'll know that um, we have a strong champion of the cause of diversity and inclusion uh, in our midst. Uh, so uh, we're doubly privileged that uh, we managed to get him uh, to keynote our conference today uh, because uh, he had taken the trouble of actually uh, studying our reports uh, on diversity uh, at the law schools that we put out year after year um, and made a strong mention of it. And you know one of the key reasons we started the program uh, is because we found that uh, 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 in 2010-2011 uh, that the law schools, uh, particularly the, the national law schools, the, uh, the top and elite law schools were getting increasingly homogeneous uh, and uh, were not representative of large parts of India. Uh, there were a number of regions, number of students, communities, etc., uh, that weren't making it to these top law schools. And given the connect between the top law schools and between the top power corridors of the legal profession, uh, we thought that uh, it's going to be pretty disastrous way down the line if we have this kind of homogeneity, uh, because homogeneity means that uh, we all think the same way, we behave the same way, society becomes more boring, uh, and most importantly, that we leave a lot of people disempowered. Uh, because they are not able to access the powerful corridors of the law. Uh, and, um, you know, I was just telling someone the other day, because we normally, uh, uh, one, of our, one of our missions at IDEA is really, uh, to put it, to, for want of a better word, to evangelize the law a little bit, uh, to make the law attractive, because in large parts of India still, uh, the law is not a very attractive uh, profession uh, for reasons more than one. One is either, and this has been our personal experience as well, when we visit a number of areas uh, in remote parts of India, uh, that if you're a decently bright student, your parents typically want you to do um, science, engineering, uh, you know, medicine, etc. Uh, the law, either they're not aware of the present opportunities, or two, the law has been painted in a very bad light, thanks to Bollywood, uh, and uh, thanks to their own experience of local lawyers who double up as pimps and touts. Uh, <clears throat> and therefore, uh, and, and, and therefore, we had a ch very challenging task of changing this perception, uh, and we tried very hard, uh, and our first uh, goal, and, and, and this was something very interesting that we learned along the way, our first thing was t when we went to some of these remote communities in these schools, and we put up images of the modern day lawyer suited, booted in law firms, because we wanted to give them an image also that, uh, you know, an aspirational value, so to speak, and we said, this is one kind of lawyering that happens today, which you may not be aware of. Uh, and we found that while some kids took to it, there was still a disconnect, because it was too far out for them. They couldn't connect with it. And then we changed track a little bit, and we said, uh, how about we bring the intellectual excitement of the law? Uh, the law at the end of the day is about persuasion, right? Uh, the law is about argument, the law is about debate, uh, the law uh, is about convincing. Uh, and so what we would typically do is, you know, pick a topic that they could easily debate upon uh, and then see uh, if they got intellectually excited about what the law has to offer. Uh, and um, uh, just, uh, I think, two years ago, we had a very interesting experience in a very small school uh, close to Bandipur, which is um, a wildlife reserve uh, on the border between uh, Karnataka and, uh, uh, and, 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 and Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Uh, and uh, in this village, it was a very, very tiny school um, uh, supported by an NGO. Uh, this uh, girl who was in class eight from the Jainu Kuruba tribe, which is a honey gatherer uh, uh, tribe, uh, who spoke, the, of course, the local language, uh, and she was pitted against three boys. What we do is we pit them one against the other, and we say, okay, we'll give you a topic, and the topic was vegetarianism versus non-vegetarianism. Uh, and she is, of course, from a tribe that eats meat, uh, and then we had two or three on the other side who were uh, uh, from the Brahmin families uh, in, 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 in that particular village, and we said, okay, you take up vegetarianism. So we make it as real as possible. And we said, now, fight it out and argue it out. And this eighth standard girl, and it, it was amazing, uh, the argument that they put forward, the opposite side put forward was, well, you're taking life uh, when, you, when you kill an animal. Uh, this is the taking of life and therefore uh, our case for vegetarianism is a strong one because we don't want to kill. 
and this little girl perks up and says, uh, but plants have life too. And our own very scientist in India, uh, J.C. Bose, had invented an instrument called the crescograph, uh, which tells you that plants feel pain. You know, it was done in India. Uh, of course, uh, J.C. Bose was a bit of a yogi as well, so shifted his research from radio waves and other things and went into plants and life and you know, became a very compassionate scientist uh, at the end of it. But uh, closely connected with his uh, spiritual journey was the fact that he, he demonstrated very, quite empirically that plants feel pain and, and plants have sensations. He said, well, if that's the case, then you know, what do you do? You, you know, just eat fallen fruit or um, you know, where do we go from here? So uh, I think she demolished the argument and then one of the questions that I that I asked the teacher and the others, is I said, what's this girl's future trajectory going to look like? Because I was absolutely astounded. I said, you know, for someone in class eight to know about J.C. Bose uh, and to put forward this argument and to think on her feet and to articulate it, I said, if she walks into any law school, she's going to give people uh, from the more privileged backgrounds a serious run for their money, right? Uh, and they said, well, she studies up to class 10 and uh, after that, uh, uh, she gets married off to someone from the tribe, and now that the government has displaced the tribe away from their natural habitat, which is the forest, and given them settlements uh, with no work, uh, most of them have taken to drinking, because we've taken them from their sus where they've learned about sustainability over years uh, with traditional wisdom, and I think uh, Professor Nandini Sundar um, studies um, these aspects uh, in more detail than any of us do, and, and hopefully we can hear from her. Uh, but uh, these are the same people that have learned to live in harmony with the natural environment, uh, and now we displace them and we bring in UN concepts of sustainable uh, environment, and we try and showcase it to them, which is something that they've known for. So it's okay if she gets married uh, to someone from within that community who most likely will be a drunkard now uh, because they have no work, and she'll be uh, beaten, and that will be uh, the end of uh, what we what we uh, know of as, a, 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 uh, as in, in terms of a career prospects. We said we can't let that happen. Uh, so we spoke to the parents, the teachers, and we took her in as the youngest idea scholar, because normally we don't take people from class eight. Uh, we put her to training, and now she's training in, 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 in uh, Mysore. Uh, uh, but, the, but this is just to demonstrate that there is so much of good talent uh, in, in various remote parts of India, lying untapped, uh, people that I think will really enrich uh, not only the profession of law, but society in general, if we can simply uh, make available the avenue for them uh, to start engaging, because these are exactly the sort, I mean, the, 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 their perspectives are very rich, very dynamic, it broadens our mind, and yesterday, for those of you who were there when we inaugurated the conference, we said a key aspect, this is not about charity. Uh, you know, we're not doing anyone a favor. Uh, and, and, you know, we may have started out idea as a benefactor beneficiary relationship but we found down the line that this is really about a mutually symbiotic relationship it's about an ecosystem that becomes richer as it gets more diverse that makes our lives more meaningful that makes our society much better off and the law schools and i can tell you as a law professor it is extremely boring for me to teach a class where people think the same way and i think other teachers as well who've been in classes will tell you the same thing judges will tell you the same thing when they sit in court and hear the same set of lawyers make the same kind of arguments with the same narrative and the same kind of framework. Lawyers will tell you the same thing that they battle up against adversaries who they know will have similar kinds of arguments and who they're prepared for. Uh, we want more excitement. We want to be intellectually more stimulated. Uh, we want to get to better versions of the truth because there is no one version of the truth. I think we need multiple perspectives. And those multiple perspectives, I think, are best told through stories. Uh, and that's exactly why uh, we decided that uh, we will do this uh, particular conference. Um, and I'll give you a little background on, on also how uh, we focus specifically on uh, law and storytelling. Uh, for those of you who are coming into IDEA for the first time, we have your files and folders. We'll have a small brochure, so please go through that. It'll give you a little bit about, uh, a little idea about what IDEA really is uh, and what we're seeking to do. Um, <clears throat> so what I will now do is really just walk you through um, uh, 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 just a few slides uh, that I have on why we started this endeavor on storytelling and why we made this a particular focus uh, today um, uh, before uh, I invite uh, Justice Chandrachud to deliver the keynote. Um, so, Okay, so I'll give you a little flavor of uh, how this began, uh, so you get some context. 
Um, uh, and I also have to thank Abhimanyu Bandari again, our, uh, our key uh, donor who, who, makes, who makes this conference possible. So thank you very much. Uh, So this, is, uh, this will be all be in your brochure, an introduction to ideas, so I'm going to skip large parts of it, except to tell you that we've sensitized, like I said, one part of our mission is really to evangelize the law a little bit, to tell people that the law is not as bad as it's made out to be in Bollywood, there are good people out there in the profession, not all are touts, uh, and that you can make a difference. If you think that the whole uh, you know, profession is tainted, uh, I think we want to create a new breed of people that will start making the law look good. Um, <clears throat> Uh, or 300 students, uh, uh, we trained for CLAT and law entrances over the last, we started in 2010, last seven, eight years. Uh, we have around 25 graduates who've come out from the law schools, and we have about 60, 70 still studying at the law schools. Uh, and they're from various backgrounds. Many of them are here with us today, uh, and I would encourage the audience to please interact and interface with them because one of the key, uh, uh, one of the key uh, uh, goals behind doing this really is to bring together our scholars uh, and uh, and, and give them as much exposure uh, to many of you who are leading thinkers uh, in your own space. These are some of the areas uh, where our scholars hail from. Uh, we have uh, scholars that have graduated, uh, Donny Ashok now, and, and we, tell, we tell our scholars that, look, you have the same set of options that the uh, typical law student or the privileged scholar has. So Donny Ashok uh, went to GNLU, graduated, took more to technology than the law because he learned how to code while he was in law school. Uh, and then said that he's more interested in technology, so now he's trying to marry his interest in technology with the law and is now going to work in Berlin for a company where he's going to develop a software on uh, artificial intelligence uh, and law. Uh, Kartika, I don't know if she's here today, she was there yesterday, uh, is now with a leading law firm uh, and she is uh, again one of our first graduates, went to NUJS, uh, graduated and like that we have several, some of them are litigating in their hometowns, some are starting to be judges. Uh, some are starting to be civil servants, taking the IAS. So a variety, a diversity of career options is what they're pursuing right now. Uh, we decided very early on that we don't want run-of-the-mill lawyers. This, that's not our mission, to put them into the national law schools and have them churn out like factory workers, you know, lawyer after lawyer with, an, with a law school stamp, uh, to go out and really just become, uh, uh, you know, again, a cog in the wheel, uh, so to speak, or just an ordinary part of the missionary. We wanted change makers, we wanted people that would transform society in whichever way. We said it's not necessary that because you're from a community, you have to go back and litigate in that community. Uh, we want you to flower to your fullest potential. So wherever it is that you think that your talent lies and wherever you think that uh, you can actualize your potential to the fullest extent possible, please pursue that. If that is in the nature of corporate law, go for it. If that's in the nature of human rights, please do it. If it's in the nature of legal journalism, you have a flair for writing and you want to expose stories and deal with the law in the mainstream media, become a legal journalist. Uh, and so we, we handle them, we guide them, and we give them the same set of options uh, that the regular privileged student at any of these elite law schools have. Uh, uh, and, and in order to make sure that we, we produced uh, lawyers uh, that were serious uh, about changing society in, 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 in more ways than one, uh, we went back and identified what are the traits that make for good leading lawyers, judges, policy makers, and others. Uh, and we studied historically who were the leading legal thinkers, legal minds, lawyers, judges, and we found that they all came with certain common set of attributes, creativity, the C, holistic, they were all holistic, H, A, altruistic, M, maverick, PS problem solvers, uh, and so we put a, CA, a CHA and PS champs, and that's how our champs training program began. And um, as part of the champs training program, we started thinking very seriously about how to reform legal pedagogy uh, in the country, uh, because we found that the law schools weren't exactly doing it right. Uh, they were, again, just ticking off the boxes in a very uh, black and white box or boxish way, saying the bar council requires this, so we'll do just minimally what the bar council requires. We said that's not enough. Uh, to just do what the bar council requires, because you know, you know, we must have some vision about what kind of law graduates we want to produce. Uh, and if you're serious about that, we have to think about how law is taught in the classroom. It cannot be a one-way uh, doctrinal uh, instructional method of teaching. We have to get students uh, to really interrogate the law, uh, to critically reflect on the law, 
to become thinkers that will move the goalposts. Uh, and we said the law is a subject that uh, is, does not have an inherent content uh, of its own, but draws content from a variety of other disciplines. So we want people that will uh, that w uh, will be exposed to multiple disciplines and that will have a slightly interdisciplinary, uh, if not a multidisciplinary perspective uh, that you can draw from the outside. You can draw from political science, sociology. You can draw from the sciences. You can draw from economics uh, and a number of other things uh, before you come in uh, and 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 and, uh, and try and create uh, solutions uh, uh, for society. Now, Christopher Columbus Langdell was a Harvard Law School dean who really placed legal pedagogy uh, and mainstreamed it to some extent, caused people to take it seriously because till the time that Langdell came along, law was taught in a very instructional mode, just a series of legal propositions uh, that were narrated to the students, students copiously took notes. In fact, not very different from what many of the law schools do today, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the professor comes in, gives you a series of legal propositions, you uh, note it down, and you're rewarded for how well you purge it back out uh, into your uh, exam paper. Uh, and, and the better you purge out, uh, and the more authentic you are to how the teacher expressed the proposition, you put the teacher's own language there, and you get full marks. Uh, think slightly differently, write a different answer, tell the teacher why he or she is wrong, or it's a wrong question, you get no marks. Right? <clears throat> And that's, uh, that's, be, that's largely been how it was then. And Langdell said, well, the law has to be scientific. It has to be treated, it has to be taught in a scientific way. And let's try and make it more of a science. Uh, and the best way to teach it is through the case method. Uh, because the law then, it was a common law country, and we wanted to experience the beauty of the law through case law and how cases were made, what went into formulating a particular legal principle in a case. Uh, a little bit of, I think there was a little bit of legal realism there. Uh, how do judges really come up with the propositions they do? What influences them? Uh, how do lawyers uh, make arguments? Uh, and how does the law get built o over time? And that was uh, largely, uh, and, and, and the whole narrative was, how do we get people to think uh, like a lawyer? You know, of course, now, uh, uh, you know, a, a number of scholars and others take a uh, huge issue with uh, just having law schools create people that think like a lawyer because they say, you know, we don't want people just thinking like a lawyer because lawyers don't always think the right way, uh, at least when it comes to values. Right? Uh, it's cold, rational, logical thinking uh, that, we, uh, that we prefer when we come to uh, an educational format that relies on thinking like a lawyer. So now the, now the narrative is we, we have to shift people away from thinking like a lawyer and have them take a more humanist approach as well. But we thought the time has come to move from the case method that Langdell invented more than 100 years ago. And uh, at IDEA, we call it the case plus method. So we say we need the cases because cases, uh, there's no better way to teach than to use uh, the situs of a case uh, to help uh, explain what the law is, how it develops, etc. But we need to go beyond the case. Uh, and that's a little bit of the uh, reason why we went into storytelling as well. Uh, because stories let you go beyond the technical nitty-gritties of the law. Right? A story humanizes the legal problem. Uh, thinking like a lawyer and scientifically rigorously deconstructing a case uh, gets you into a very cold, logical, rational frame. I mean, you have uh, the left side of your brain working much more, but we almost dumbed down the right side. Right? So when we talk about lawyers and, uh, you know, should lawyers, uh, what, what, what makes for a great lawyer, what makes for a good lawyer, what sort of value should they come with? Uh, and we said we need to move a little bit away from just a cold, logical, rational analysis of the law. We need values to come in. We need people to be compassionate, empathetic, creative. You can't have just the right left brain working if it's creativity. Uh, you also need people uh, working up there, the, the right hemisphere uh, of their brain. Uh, and we need people that will go beyond the law. Uh, uh, and because most of the creative solutions never come from within your own discipline. If you look at the most creative people across centuries, uh, these are people that dabbled in different domains. So you get the intelligence from one domain, the wisdom from one domain, and somehow you cross-pollinate it uh, with the domain that you're working on. And that's how a lot of the good creative ideas come. So we use the case as a starting point in our case plus method, uh, but then we branch out. We use the case as uh, one of the centers in, within which to begin our inquiry. Uh, and I'll, sh I'll just sh briefly walk, and we focus on the basics, because like, as I mentioned yesterday when we started out our conference, uh, the problem is that law students today and law schools today uh, are geared towards giving them the latest fad that is happening within the legal industry. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, people want to know about Aadhaar, uh, uh, but they don't want to know about the law of thoughts. Uh, and, the, and the law of thoughts is what gave you the law of privacy, and privacy is important when it comes to Aadhaar. Uh, similarly, they want to know about cyber law, uh, but they don't understand that a lot of, there's nothing called real cyber law. I mean, it's all 
law, tort law, contract law, property law, that you apply to cyberspace. But without understanding the fundamentals, you can't build on top. Uh, and I think uh, a good way to express it, although he's not very popular today, Elon Musk for a variety of reasons, uh, but given that uh, uh, Musk uh, is a master of many domains, knowledge domains, uh, uh, you know, is a, is a man who was told when he wanted to send a rocket to, uh, to Mars, was told that it's impossible because it's too expensive. Uh, you can't get a, 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 a rocket within the cost that you have in mind. He went back, studied how to make a rocket, and then produce a cheaper rocket. Right? So uh, uh, could dabble in multiple domains, can pick up multiple domains, and somebody asked him, how do you study? And he said, well, I just focus on the tree trunk. The trunk of the tree I build, it's, knowledge is like a semantic tree, so I focus on the foundations, the roots and the trunk, and then I can just add the leaves very easily. Right? And that's one of our goals, to really build the trunk, to build the roots, so that the leaves, the leaf is the Aadhaar and the cyber and IT and all of those new fads that come out. But the trunk is really the foundational concepts. If you build the trunk, it's easy to attach the leaves. If you build just the leaves, it's like a superstructure. Uh, we build a superstructure, you build four stories or five stories without a strong foundation, your building will crumble. Uh, but if you build the foundation strong enough, uh, then it's easy for you to play around with concepts. It's easy for you to create. It's, you become a far better lawyer and you become a far better uh, solutioner or problem solver. Now, this example, again, I narrated yesterday uh, on how one of our own idea scholars, uh, after watching a six-part series on the law and a jury trial, uh, interestingly, gave me an insight that I myself never had, uh, which, which is on storytelling, and he said, well, the law seems to be like a game. And this is a person who's had no exposure to the law, watched the series of a murder trial, and says, the law seems like a game. Whoever tells a better story wins. Uh, and I said, well... <laughs> I mean, beautifully put, this is an insight that even after so many years of the law that I've never had, but excellently put. <clears throat> and we have a lot of interfaces with the law and literature. We have law in literature. A lot of, uh, when you read a lot of literature, you find a lot of, and I, I suspect that many of you came into law uh, because of uh, the kind of virtues that you saw in literature of uh, leading lawyers, people who fought for justice, uh, and I can tell you that uh, some of the people that I interact with, I think To Kill a Mockingbird made a lot of difference for them in terms of how it inspired them to come into the law. Uh, and we have that, that part. We won't discuss uh, much uh, of that today. Uh, I don't know if any of the speakers uh, in the panels will bring it up, but that's one part of it, law in literature. The other is law as literature, which is that the structure of law itself is conducive uh, to analyzing it as literature, because law is about narrative. Right? And it's about narrative structures, and I found, uh, you know, the former dean of uh, the Stanford Law School put it beautifully, Kathleen Sullivan, gone back into practice, a litigate, leading litigator now, but put it beautifully and said, what is the legal method at the end of the day? Said it's a branch of rhetoric that gives normative force to interpretation and, and analysis. It's a set of interpretative techniques of problem solving that disaggregate and order the messy jumble of facts through which conflict presents itself. And I thought it's beautifully put. That tells you exactly why the law is really about narrative. Right? We're trying to make sense of facts, we're trying to make sense of, and we're trying to decide what set of facts should prevail here, what makes sense, uh, and what should we base uh, the legal solution on. Uh, and I think we'll hear more from Justice Santachud uh, on this, because uh, as a judge, how do you separate out these things? Which story do you believe? Uh, and, and how do you reflect it uh, in your judgment? Again, one of the judges in an old uh, uh, U.S. case uh, uh, says, calls it the Rashomon effect. I don't know how many of you have seen this brilliant movie, Japanese Akira Kurosawa movie, uh, but it's, uh, it's a murder, uh, and it's different people with different versions uh, of who committed the murder, who killed whom, and who was responsible. Uh, and all of them, uh, the interesting part is, all of them tell their stories with utmost sincerity. Uh, so you don't know who to believe. Right? And that's what the judge says. Cases like this call upon courts to reenact re Rashomon, uh, as in the great Japanese drama. The characters recite their stories with evident sincerity. But is it possible for courts in these cases to get to the truth any more than was possible in the classic Japanese play? It was a play first and then it was made into a movie. And so one of the cases that, foundational cases that we picked to teach our students was Donahue versus Stevenson. And Donahue versus Stevenson, again, uh, when I was taught in law school, again, in an instructional mode, you had to write three points. It's a duty of care, uh, it's the first case that laid the foundation for negligence, and pr you get more marks if you put the year uh, and the date in which it was decided, and the names of the judges, right? Full marks, right? Uh, well, what's, <laughs> what's really this case about? How did it build the law? What went on in the mind of the judge? It's a beautiful story. So I went back, did some reading on it, many years after I learned about it in class, and I said, my God, this is a beautiful case to teach, and I can, sp I can teach an entire course 
through just, just this alone because all the things that happen in this case are playing out even today as we speak. <clears throat> so you, we had a, a, a judge ruling uh, in this case laid the foundations of the doctrine of negligence which is one of the foundational aspects of law which is that you have to take care as a manufacturer uh, when you build products uh, because you could end up hurting the consumer. If you don't take that care and you end up hurting the consumer, you need to pay. It's very simple. Uh, but interestingly, this principle, which now is so simple to you, it took, uh, uh, it, it took a very strong case and it took uh, a very strong dissent. There was a strong dissent in this as well because the precedent till then did not have this general principle. It had very small uh, uh, cases that were very tailored to their facts that said, well, you could have a liability if it's a dangerous good or not otherwise. Uh, and this was the first case that actually laid down as a general principle. Uh, it was a case that was known for its persuasive prose. That's why it became so popular. So Lord Atkins, uh, who is the, the key uh, judge in this case that wrote the, pop, the opinion that became, you know, in today's age viral, it got picked up, uh, was because he was brilliant at prose. And if you look at Arthur Quiller Couch, again, again goes back to how the law is about narrative. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you write judgments, uh, Arthur Quiller Couch says, what's the cardinal virtue for judicial prose, right? What's the best virtue when you write a judgment? And he said, persuasion. And Lord Atkins' speech in Donny vs. Stevenson is an outstanding piece of prose, right? Uh, and in the best prose, we are so led on as we read that we do not stop to applaud the writer, nor do we stop to question him. It's a case that has a lot of wit and wisdom because Lord Atkins again says, this is so obvious a proposition that the manufacturer must pay that the only people that will tell you, no, it's not right, are the lawyers. Everyone else will know that there's commonsensical wisdom in this proposition. Again, this case is brilliant because, uh, again, McCormick, who's an academic, calls it a case that reflects structured pluralism, which is, again, something that we wanted to convey to the students because this one case, which is polycentric, uh, and this one decision will tell you that it embodies the best of precedent. The judge created was creative, but he still stuck to precedent. He didn't, he didn't say, I'm going to disregard everything that happened earlier. I will creatively interpret it within, this, within the framework of precedent and still tell you why we can evolve a general principle. Right? Uh, it involves principle, it involves logic, analogy, policy, and pragmatism. It's a convincing legal story setting up a good case for the conclusion reached. It's a story of religion. It's a very devout Christian judge. And people that found his diaries after the case found that he, had, he was waiting for a case like this. Uh, and so he picked up the biblical story of the Good Samaritan and said that, well, I can't force people to love their neighbors because Allah can't force you to love but the law can force you not to harm. So therefore, the principle of liability is you can't harm your neighbor, you can't harm the people that you ought to have in contemplation when you sell your goods. Um, and, and that's the principle of liability, but I can't force love. So I have to take the, the biblical proposition and change it slightly. The characters, it was a lady who was on, uh, on the verge of a divorce, changed her name multiple times, so you'll find conflicting case reports uh, with multiple names. But uh, again, she had a very interesting issue, she was a pauper, wasn't very well to do, but fortunately found a pro bono lawyer, uh, who was again hell-bent on, on pinning liability on the manufacturers, and therefore the case happened. Otherwise, without access to a pro bono lawyer, this case would have never seen the light of the day. And if you look at how it played out, it's very similar to how things play out today with pro bono lawyering. Uh, and of course, finally, she settled the matter uh, because the case never went to trial. It was on a principle of, just on the legal principle. The court said we will accept the facts as, uh, we, will ex we, will, we will hypothetically accept the facts that are pleaded uh, and simply decide on whether there's legal liability as a matter of principle. But before it went to trial, uh, the case was settled. So we'll never know if there was a snail or not. I mean, the facts of the case was that two ladies went out to a cafe, uh, had ginger ale uh, in, a, in a float, what they, what they call ging ginger ale in an ice cream float, and out popped a dead snail uh, from the ginger ale bottle. Uh, and she, as a result of which, she got gastroenteritis, uh, which, which is what she pleaded in her claims, uh, and claimed damages. And then the whole question was, well, I can't sue the cafe owner, because the cafe owner says, it's not my ginger ale bottle, it's a manufacturer. It's sealed, it's opaque, I can't see it, I'm not liable. And the whole question was, should, should we pin liability? It's a case on legal creativity, like I mentioned, because the judge really, the earlier case law didn't help very much, but still he managed to adapt earlier case law and evolve a broad legal proposition. Uh, I found it quite fascinating because I know that uh, uh, this shift in paradigm from object, earlier as I mentioned, it was a shift from object, it was focused on objects. Are these dangerous goods? Only then is the liability. And the judge very cleverly moved it to relationships. Said, well, liability should hinge on, are you my neighbor? 
should I have you in contemplation when I commit an act? If you're my neighbor and I do an act that harms you and I know fully well that it could potentially harm you, then I am liable. So moved it from object to relation uh, and I noticed that uh, 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 Justice Santitude had done something similar uh, in the C 377 judgment, uh, moved the paradigm a little bit uh, from the focus of the act to the relationship itself. Okay, so that's, uh, and of course there was a dissent, very strong dissent, which didn't become very popular because it was extremely vitriolic. People didn't like it. Uh, I mean, the judge, it almost looked that the judge had a per personal animus against uh, uh, the petitioner. And so that comes out very clearly in the legal writings as well. And you can see how, uh, when you study the law and you study cases, uh, what really circulates, uh, what becomes viral as a judgment, uh, oftentimes is the one that appeals uh, to people in a strong way. But I think pe people tend to react very sharply uh, when they see opinions that seem to harbor some kind of a personal animus against w w one or more parties. And that's what happened with the dissent, which is actually technically quite rigorous. Uh, and he's a very sharp judge, probably smarter than Lord Atkins, uh, but couldn't carry the weight of the day because it was extremely vitriolic. The whole story to judges make law, I think great case for it, because if you read the proposition as laid down, it really reads like if you were sitting as a parliamentary policymaker, how would you frame the law on negligence? It's that beautifully put, right? Um, uh, and it's always going to be a debate, uh, and I think, uh, uh, at least my own personal view is that till the time that the English language has ambiguity and has no precision in the way that we mathematically want it, judges will continue to make policy in the way that we understand policy to mean that you must have some kind of uh, a, a broader thinking uh, about where this case is going to lead uh, in terms of the impact that it has. And interpretation always will be a policy-driven exercise, uh, at least to my mind. Uh, but we'll hear more about that as the sessions go. Okay, so with that, uh, I've given you, in a, and on, of course, we use the case also to, uh, to situate the case within how the law developed over time. Now, of course, uh, students don't study Donahue because uh, little realizing that Donahue set the stone for a consumer protection law, for food adulteration law, for drugs and cosmetics law, for privacy law, uh, for... Uh, the law on liability of drones, artificial intelligence, everything you can track back to this case. Uh, and and typically when I go to law students, I start with this slide. And I say, you want to know about AI and all those things? Uh, because that's what they're most keen on? Please, now we'll, we'll talk about the case that actually led on to it. Right. Uh, so this has been our experience with pedagogy. This is, uh, is how we started out. And one more book that influenced me, please pick it up if you ever have the chance. I uh, had a colleague in the US uh, who was teaching law, who was a literature major, and she taught the entire taught slot through this one book. It's called The Sweet Hereafter. Uh, it's about a bus accident where a uh, number of school children got killed. It was made into a movie as well. This uh, book was awarded, uh, and, the, and the movie is also critically acclaimed. Uh, but the entire tort law, she thought through this story. It's called The Sweet Hereafter. Thank you, Arnab, for getting it to me to get it all the way from Calcutta. Uh, but, um, uh, 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 but again, how the law can be taught through stories. 